What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Lights Out. We have a crazy, disturbing, controversial case. We're going to be covering Eldon Samuel III. Junior and Tina were heavily addicted to a variety of prescription medications. It's estimated that in over a decade, he had got over 560 prescriptions written from 36 different doctors. As it got worse, he soon thought that the world was going to come to an end, so it was time for him to start diving into doomsday prepper lifestyle. They immediately handcuffed him and placed him in the back of the squad car, where he quietly talked to himself. I had a shock and move two at a time. Then I started like, trying to get him under the bed. Five shots to the legs. Why'd you do it? My brother. Light out. Everybody. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Lights Out. Joined in the studio are the boys yet again, Austin and Danny. What's going on, guys? Not much. What's going on with you? Very tired. My uh, my daughter's been uh, waking up very, very early because she's teething. So it's been uh, some early mornings for me. So I'm trying to like pound in a Celsius over here. It's nice. like. I already had like three cups of coffee when I first woke up, but I'm just like pumping myself with caffeine. Cause I'm like, oh, well, I have no excuse over here. I'm always just pumping myself up with caffeine. That's all right. That's all right. How are you doing, Danny? I'm doing pretty good, man. Doing pretty good. Well, well, we've got a crazy case for you. I mean, when do we don't have a crazy case, but we have a crazy, disturbing, controversial case. We're going to be covering uh, a young boy at the time of these murders named Eldon Samuel III. And this case has kind of been coined by the media as a zombie apocalypse murders. Yes. Want to explain just a little bit of why yeah, that is the case? We're going to be dealing with um, his, the killer's father was a prepper and he was very paranoid that the zombie apocalypse was about to happen. And this was circa the time when zombies were very in the media, super popular. You know? I remember those times. Yeah. It was like, Turn on the TV, there was something zombie related. Every single time. AMC was playing some zombie movie. Yeah, it was always. And then they all had the reality TV shows for the prepping. Uh, so it was a very specific era of doomsday. And also they had the 2012 was the right, thing. Yeah. Right? So yeah, it's put yourself back in that time, you know. Did you ever worry a little bit? About a zombie apocalypse? I I can't say that I ever did. Did you? You know, I considered it. Yes. You know, I considered it as a possibility because I've read so many articles where, like during this time too, there are like articles from like scientists would come out because you know the media would want to know that like is this possible? And so I'd I'd read some scientific articles and they're like technically not possible in the way that like media per you know portrays it but sure. a virus or something like this that could potentially mutate or you know oh, i thought you were gonna say if everyone sm starts smoking k2 or something that or that drugs. or <laughs> yeah or if some street drug goes around which i mean as we know drugs can definitely put you in a zombie-like state for so. sure and there's a lot of drugs involved in this case as well yes yeah, so if anyone that's the irony of this case is really if anyone was the zombie it was the dad yeah yeah, it's a very, very sad and tragic case as well. Just the, the end result is bad all the way around. Yeah, 100%. But before we dive into uh, Eldon's case here, I did want to remind you that Malhar Media's documentary, 530 Days, is being released next Tuesday, December 19th, on the True Crime with Kendall Ray YouTube channel. And we have the final extended trailer that we want to show you now. Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are all having a great day. You can sign the petition and you can make a short phone call and an email. It's going to make a huge difference. Jessica called fearful and asking for her help. 10 days later, while family members held a search party in the neighborhood, it was her sisters who found her body near the 610 underpass, a six minute walk from her home. I, I did not see her being in a situation that would even enable her to make those choices. And literally the very first one that came to my mind was, 
she would never be caught dead the way she was caught. And that is the part I mean by consistent. I got involved in it because I saw the missing flyer on Facebook and thought to myself, that's weird. Like, people don't go missing around here. With over 30,000 signatures on a change.org petition, asking authorities to review her death once more. She was caring and she always had a story to tell. She was really patient with me. She used to just let me hang out and feel like I was, you know, hanging out with the college kids, which, you know, felt really special. Her realness, like she never judged. Never judged me, always would lift me up. She would always tell me I'm beautiful if, I mean, just anything. Oh, Justin, did they go and notify Justin? No. He's seen all the activity and all the neighbors outside. And he's seen all the cop cars. And he got nervous and he went to the police station. You know, you have people that never saw her and that she was already clearly alienated from her friends and from everyone else. In the months leading up to this project, we petitioned the office of Jason Williams, the DA of New Orleans, more times than we can recall. It's also been difficult to hear anything from the New Orleans Police Department, who still rule Jessica's death as unclassified. No suspects have been identified. Jessica wasn't just trash that was thrown away. Why did it take so long for the coroner to release her body? Next of kin didn't give a shit about it. So you feel there is some type of cover-up? However small the cover-up is, it's been brushed. Nobody went in the department. It is him. The only advocate for your family will be you. Do you think there's any alternative potential theories to what happened? No. My sister was murdered. There it is. So I'm excited for all of you to see the whole documentary in whole. We've been hard at work on this for months and months now. And I know all of you are going to find it extremely interesting and probably leave you very pissed off as well. Just the, the state of New Orleans is beyond repair at this point. It seems like the whole city needs to just be torn down and, and rebuilt with all new leadership because it is just an absolute mess down there. Crime is out of control. They have a DA down there that's not doing anything about the crime it's just it's just a complete mess and obviously jessica easterly's family um you know is looking for justice for their their loved one and that's ultimately the goal with this is to raise awareness around the case and hopefully something happens hopefully pressure's put on those in charge to do something with all the you know all of you watching this and supporting uh this cause so very excited for y'all to see that and uh, lastly, I just want to mention, we still have the Lights Out Puff Print Hoodies Heavyweight Edition at LightsOutCast.shop. Get them while you can. And yeah, that's all I got. Nice. Should we just dive in? Yeah, th we should dive headfirst into this one. It's pretty wild. Here we go. Eldon Samuel II married his wife, Tina McCurdy, in Northern California in 1998. And their first son, who we've been talking about, Eldon Gale Samuel III, was born in 1999. So we're gonna try not to make this too confusing with multiple Eldon Samuels, three Eldon Samuels technically. We're gonna call the grandfather the oldest Eldon, Eldon Senior, then Eldon the second, Junior, and Eldon the third will just be Eldon. So Eldon Junior is young Eldon's father in yes. this case. Yes. The couple also had a second son named Jonathan Samuel, who was born a year later in 2000. Jonathan was a special needs child, and some sources say he was severely autistic. And that's just based on the information that we could find out there. We don't know 100% one way or another. At first, the Samuels lived a basic life in Modesto, California, and for the most part, they were liked by their neighbors and their community. The father, Jr., worked in local politics, and when his boys were young, he once ran for city council in Modesto, which is pretty crazy to think about as we go forward here. But he thought the city needed better infrastructure, rent control, and less crime. Sounds good. Yeah, I'm on board with that. His plan was to run drug dealers and drug users out of town. Another, okay. another good point. Then he planned on lowering rent, increasing housing for the elderly, and increasing funding for police and firefighters. But sadly, he ended up losing his bid for city council. And after his loss, he became noticeably angry and disgruntled. Then tragedy struck early on when the boys were just three and four years old, as her mother, Tina, was in a serious car accident, and ever since the accident, she struggled with chronic pain for most of her life. 
Junior also suffered from a shoulder injury while working as a mechanic. And even though Junior's platform was against drug use, he and his wife Tina began abusing painkillers, especially hydrocodone. Over the next decade, Tina also later tried to take her own life several times by overdosing. Junior would bounce around from doctor to doctor looking for prescriptions. He could easily get muscle relaxers and opiates for his shoulder pain, and he was also prescribed medications for anxiety and sleep. It's estimated that in over a decade, he had got over 560 prescriptions written from 36 different doctors. There were estimated to be about 50,000 to 60,000 pills split between him and his wife. Their drug abuse soon caused them financial turmoil, and they lost their home. And then they were forced to move into low-income rental complexes they could barely afford. Junior also became violent during this time, and according to Eldon, his father would physically abuse him and his mother. He would beat his son's legs and feet so that bruises couldn't be seen by others while Eldon was wearing long pants and shoes. And because of the abuse, Eldon started missing a lot of school. As for Jonathan, his father wouldn't physically abuse him, but he would break his toys and things that were important to him. The abuse escalated to the point where, according to Eldon, his father poured lighter fluid all over Tina and threatened to burn her alive. When Eldon was six years old, his father also hit Tina with the family car and she was hospitalized for a broken collarbone. So Eldon's father's just an absolute piece of shit. Yeah. Four years after this incident, he tied Tina up with duct tape for hours and held a gun to her head. And then he forced Eldon, now 10 years old, to urinate on his mother. Throughout their marriage, both Tina and Junior filed restraining orders against each other for the domestic violence, and it wasn't long before their son became violent as well. When Eldon was six years old, he began to physically bully his younger brother. Eventually, some of the neighbors heard what was going on inside of the Samuel household. One day, it was so bad that one of the neighbors actually called the police, and Child Protective Services was also contacted. And this wasn't the first time that CPS had been sent to the Samuel household, as you can imagine. One of the neighbors claimed they saw Tina hitting one of her sons, so she was arrested. She later pled no contest to a charge of willful child cruelty and was sentenced to six months in the county jail. As for the children's father, they did nothing. And while he had custody of the boys, his drug abuse escalated and he developed severe paranoia. As it got worse, he soon thought that the world was going to come to an end. So it was time for him to start diving into doomsday prepper lifestyle. So we've set the stage for pretty much a terrible household up to this point and now the dad is getting into the prepper mindset so if you don't know what preppers are they're basically a fringe group that they've become more popular in the past oh yeah decade two decades um and there's estimated that there's nine million americans that participate in prepping to some degree that could be anything from like food storage to you know the people bunker. we see on tv yeah, yeah exactly but you know, the famous ones, they're known for building bomb shelters, underground hideouts, food shelters, and on top of this, they also stockpile weapons and ammunition a lot of the times. The idea is that when the world ends, you and your family will just, that'll be it. You'll have to fend for yourselves. The world is chaos. And it depends on what that is. It could be a natural or man-made disaster. Sometimes worst case scenarios is the government has collapsed, uh, society, martial laws. Yeah, yeah it's like just that. become a total war zone. Everything falls into oblivion. Some people think there will be a massive civil war. Some believe that they'll poison the water supply or the food supply. Some think it'll be like the game Fallout, which I don't know if you guys ever played those oh, back yeah. in the day. This super fun games, but it's basically nuclear Armageddon. Everyone, you know, had to go into the shelters. Mm -hmm. But obviously there's layers and layers onto that story. So could be a plethora of things. But what Junior ended up believing was that the zombie apocalypse was just for sure going to come. It was right around the corner. And this was also you know, not coincidentally, this was around the cultural height of our fascination with zombies. If you remember the show, The Walking Dead, it was like the biggest show on it was. TV. It was. And Rest in peace, Walking Dead, man. Yeah. Whatever. Okay. I stopped watching after season three, but what? Happened? I stopped watching it after like season five, I think. Okay. Because it just got so bad. It just dragged on and nothing ever happened really. And it just became super depressing. 
did it yeah like everyone's just dying yeah it just and, and it seemed like they didn't know where to go with the story at some point but i mean the first two seasons are gold so good yeah I mean, amazing stuff it's hard like i don't know about you but when i watch shows like the walking dead or most recently last of us um there's also a show on apple tv called silo uh which is kind of you know doomsday-ish i'm not gonna lie after watching those shows especially last of us i was like may not be a bad idea to uh start prep prepping a bit. <laughs> yeah. and i'm not gonna lie i definitely uh i have a few things yeah yeah um for i have food rations yeah. or at least i think which you can buy like kits now survival kits and things like that i've definitely started building out a little like survival you know kit for my family i don't think that's irrational um i i know the mormons like if you ever go totally. into a mormon's yeah. basement they always have food storage because they're i think they're they say like oh for a year but really a lot of them i think it's three months food supply several days water supply i i think that's the bare minimum i could be wrong on that sorry if you're mormon and you're listening and i'm totally wrong on that but i don't think that's irrational because w it could just be w terrible weather maybe you get snowed in for right, three days right. or something like it's it's not a crazy idea to have that well and also with the pandemic if you remember especially at the beginning shelves were being cleared no toilet it was hard paper. to get stuff and yeah. you know stores are closed i think that event really just kind of pushed me in this direction too of like rather be prepared you know rather have what i need than be sorry i didn't get it you yeah know I mean? it's for not sure. that like if you have the space to do it why not just get some basic rations you know or if like the power grid ever goes down or something like that basically it's just being self-sustainable to yeah. some extent right yeah it's not necessarily like taking it to the next level where you're like also i'm going to build the world's largest armory yeah so that if tanks roll in my front yard i'm ready to go yeah you know right what i mean for battle because my shotgun can defend against right. the u.s military tank coming in or a drone strike right yeah no i don't think that's irrational at all so you know I, this was just walking dead you had TLC, Discovery Channel. I think History Channel even had some reality TV shows. Yeah, I know Prepper National Family. Geographic had a Doomsday Prepper series. Which one was the one where they rated them? They're like, you will survive for 17 days. You're actually not that prepared. I feel like it was the National Geographic okay, one. Okay, that was my favorite one. And I remember one of the episodes, a family member needed insulin. And insulin needs to be stored in a cool area right. built beneath a certain temperature. And this family thought that they could take the insulin and store it in the nearby river because it was cool enough. And they were just like, absolutely not. not this would never work. work out. So unfortunately, we are restricted by a lot of things like that. And even the most prepared preppers, you're not really going to last that long. I also think my last comment on this is that we always think that we're the main character in a zombie scenario. Like, oh, I got this. I'm the guy shooting the zombies in the head and like, I'm going to survive. Nah, <laughs> if we're going to be taken nope. out, I'll be a zombie in like 30 minutes. It's that's, just, what, that's what Kendall always says to me. She's like, I'll just let them eat me. Yeah. Like, if that's what Fine. happens, then I don't even want to be alive. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, no, I will survive. <laughs> yes, yeah. I will take my child and carry her across the country <laughs> yeah. to some settlement yeah where we can live that is the that's the fantasy for sure but, but it's you know it's like it's all fun and games until it actually happens yeah and like shit do i even want to live in this world anymore like, yeah that'd be a dark aftermath yeah so aside from the zombie hype around this time which i mentioned this earlier there was also the theory that december 21st 2012 which was actually my 20th birthday the world was supposed to end. People were connecting the dots like Nostradamus and right, stuff like yeah. that. Mind so, calendar stuff. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So people were, there was, I don't know, with all the zombie hype, with all the world ending hype, I could, you know, Junior is doing a lot of drugs at this point. So that paranoia is kicking in. Yeah. It's and like, then, oh shit, what if yeah, it hits the fan? Am I prepared? Exactly. And yeah. since American media was like hyping that stuff up, a lot of us saw it as fun, but I think in his, for him, he was like, oh, this is serious. The Which I feel end. like, I don't know about you, but I feel like the media puts stuff out like this conveniently to kind of like poison our minds into to believing this reality. You know what I mean? You like, think so? There's like definitely, there's definitely subliminal messaging going on with the media. I feel like it's sometimes it's just too perfectly placed 
that you're like, they knew that this was going to resonate with people right now. That's why they put this out. For sure. And around, you know, 2008, the financial recession happened. People were in the dumps. And yeah, I could see that there's like, doomsday is this attractive thing so so basically junior much like us he just wouldn't stop talking about the zombie apocalypse the end of the world it was just his obsession at first he taught his sons how to use knives as a self-defense weapon and he would even now keep in mind his sons are very young at this they're within the age of 10 and he would be teaching them how to stab a zombie in the brain wow i don't know about you but that's i don't know pretty violent to teach a young kid and then he even escalated to training him with firearms and he taught his sons how to shoot nothing inherently wrong there i think the stabbing that's all that's all fine but like hand-to-hand combat with knives that early on like yeah that's kind of weird uh on the weekends he would take his sons to makeshift boot camp sessions out in the wilderness they would bring their camping gear and their father would teach them how to survive which also, again that's not inherently bad. yeah that's not boy scouts basically right yeah nothing nothing is a, a red flag here i think maybe the everything together is a red flag but nothing singled out as a red flag really i guess it's different when it's out of fear yeah right it's like we're doing this not because it's just a good skill to have but no we need this to survive when the zombie apocalypse hits yeah and the zombie apocalypse will hit right is what he's telling him so that's the red flag which to young kids i mean that's gonna oh, that's gonna man. fuck them up so yeah junior was so convinced he was putting his sons through these training programs out in the woods he would put them through obstacle courses some days he would show his sons how to cut off the head and tail of a snake Sometimes he would force his sons to get down on their stomachs and crawl across the forest, and then he would start shooting live rounds above them, trying to simulate this like violent dystopian future where their lives were just constantly at stake. And then after a full day of physical training, he would take their sons back to the camper, and then they would watch zombie movies all night. Keep in mind, Junior was not working at this time. He was currently on government assistance. Other times he was selling his prescription drugs for money. But really, just most of his days, he was just hanging out on the couch, obsessing over the zombie apocalypse and feeding this information to his sons. I assume he was on disability after that accident. His shoulder. Most likely. That's a a good call. I never found the actual evidence of that, but that would be a good guess, I'd say. Um, And then he even started, he would always go out in public with his 9mm handgun in his waistband. So... He was clearly getting more paranoid as time went on. Because at any point, yeah, you never know. Face to face with a zombie. If you're like me, you know, you love Christmas, but man, sometimes the holiday season leading up to Christmas, it's hectic, it's stressful, you're spending a ton of money. But luckily, HelloFresh is here to save the day. You can skip the grocery store, save time, easy and tasty recipes delivered straight to your door. Honestly, after a full day of work, it's hard to come home, think, even think about going to the grocery store, thinking about finding a recipe, throwing it all together. So HelloFresh makes it easy. You can turn those busy weeknights into just delicious meal times. And I know some of their meals, they might take a little bit longer, 30, 40 minutes sometimes, but they do have 15 minute meals that you should look into if you're concerned about time. The other thing I really love about HelloFresh meals is that you can always spice it up. They give you the spice packets that you need, but it's really, you know, I think of HelloFresh, it's the foundation. They give you the paintbrush, the paint, the canvas, but really it's up to you to make the masterpiece here. Sometimes I just go veggie options and then I add my protein in. You know, I can always mix it up because we have people in the household that don't eat meat. So I cook up a bomb vegetarian meal, but I'll also throw some chicken in there that's all spiced up. You can really make it your own. And did you know, that HelloFresh does more than just dinners. From easy breakfast to start your morning off right to 10 minute lunches, or you just want a satisfying snack for both adults and kids. HelloFresh has tasty choices for every single mealtime occasion. And you know what? The best part, honestly, no going to the grocery store. Go to HelloFresh.com slash lights out free and use code lights out free for free breakfast for life. One breakfast item per box while subscription is active. That's free breakfast for life at HelloFresh.com slash LightsOutFree with code LightsOutFree. Remember, HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. 
When Tina returned from jail, she put up with a new obsession with zombies and the prepper lifestyle. Before long, Junior's drills got more intense. He had programmed his sons to believe that the end was near and they needed to be ready at all costs. They were essentially living in a constant state of fear as the end of the world was always looming. And at any moment, their father could run an intense drill to test how ready they really were. He'd often run a drill early in the morning where he set off an alarm and timed how quickly they could get out of bed, gather their supplies and weapons, and get into the camper van. He ran this drill so often that his sons could complete this drill in around 45 seconds. If they failed to improve their time, they were afraid their abusive father would physically harm them or break their things. While in school, Eldon struggled. His grades suffered and his classmates thought he was strange. He was a loner for the most part. Whenever anyone tried to talk to him, he would always bring up his obsession with knives and the zombie apocalypse. He quickly became an outcast and ended up being bullied and getting into fights. And it got to the point where he would skip school and stay home watching movies or playing zombie shooter video games with his father. Sometimes Tina would get frustrated and leave the house, but she would never take her sons with her. They were always left behind in the strange zombie apocalypse boot camp that their father was running. After a few days or sometimes even a few weeks, Tina would eventually come back to the house. But by 2012, she had had enough. She left the house once and for all. She then divorced Junior, and since she had a previous record of neglect, Junior was given full custody of the children. Up until now, the family had moved upwards of 20 times because they couldn't afford rent, and it's reported that some of these units had cockroach infestations. That's just horrible. Junior and his sons then plan on moving one more time. They'd go to Idaho to be closer with Eldon Sr., their grandfather. Anthony, Junior's son from a previous relationship, believed that his father was moving out of California to get off drugs and focus on parenting. Anthony knew his father had a drug problem and often became violent, but he later claimed that he was never violent toward him or his sisters. Junior's daughter, Natasha, from the same previous relationship, suspected her father was lying. She later said that her half-brother, Eldon, quote, never had a chance when talking about his upbringing. Either way, Junior had convinced most of his family that he was going to get clean and turn his life around. But really, he had other plans in mind. He only said he was going to get clean because he didn't want Tina worrying or fighting for custody of their sons. Eldon Sr., the oldest of the Eldons, also believed his son was genuinely trying to turn his life around, and he believed that Tina had been the aggressor in the household. I actually have a clip of Eldon Sr. talking about his son's anger issues and Tina's violence in the household. Did you see any anger issues with him? Well, no, I used to, yeah. What do you mean, used to? Well, he used to just, his eyes would bulge out and stuff, and he'd get really, really angry. When was that? Oh, a few years ago, and it, uh, actually with Tina, because they lived on the beach in Modesto, and I, 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 I helped him buy a window and a sliding glass door. Then when he moved over on the east side of Modesto, then I helped him replace two sliding glass doors. Why is that? Because he said he couldn't afford it. No, but how did they get broken? And Tina threw a lamp the first time through the door, and the second time she tried to push a chair through the door. And he didn't do these, but you're thinking Tina did it? He told me Tina did it. So I believe him? Well, yeah, in a way, because she's a messed up lady. But your son isn't? Well, I'm thinking now, yeah, maybe so. You're yeah. thinking maybe now. Yeah. now? So you don't know for sure, you just... And what he told you, right? Yeah, what he told me, I know, because I'm not, well, that's their life. Not so did you see him get angry with the kids? Uh, not in that way, no. I need your total honesty on this. No. I know you do. Why are we smiling? No, I'm just, I want maybe to talk about this. I, uh, I'm trying to think of uh, the time he did lose his temper. Well, he never hit those kids in front of me. He didn't? No, but he would yell at them. What would he yell? How would he yell at them? A real high voice. Type of voice. Would he ever uh, cuss at them? No, he didn't in front of me, but he might have when they were by themselves. Okay, so did you ever see him uh, he knows I don't use physical... Um, well, I'm not I'm not and stuff, and he, well, anything. No, not in front of me. 
Not and that's not to say it wouldn't happen when nobody else was around. That is to say that I never seen it, no. Okay. And what would he yell at um, Johnny? No, he would yell at the other one, Eldon. It's very obvious to me that Eldon Sr. is just being defensive uh, when being asked these questions about his son. Yeah. And, you know, he keeps saying, not in front of me, not in front of me. But it's clear that you had suspicions that right, this was right. going on, at least. And uh, all right, I'm not trying to take the moral high road here. I'm not trying to be super judgy, but there was someone in my family who was married and we had people throwing lamps through glass doors and shattering shit like that. There would be like a full blown intervention with my family. Like, it would be like, okay. We're going on family trial here because yeah, yeah. something's clearly wrong inside this household. And that maybe that's hard for him to admit that it's like this was going on. So he just, yeah, he is super defensive about it. Well, he was quick to blame Tina too. Yeah. And not be like, well, it's not why is thing. Tina mad? You know, right. Yeah. Who's, ma- who's instigating these fights? Right. Clearly his son in, in some way, shape or form, but. I mean, it, he's doing what most parents would probably do in the situation and trying to not paint him in a bad light. Because you wouldn't want, you know, if your son is failing at something, it's kind of a reflection on you, right? right? right. So, yeah. Which, before we continue, I also wanted to just quickly shout out, explore with us, uh, friends of the show, for uh, doing the FOIA request to get these files. Um, they they did the the hard work and paid the money to uh, get this interrogation footage that we're showing throughout this episode. So shout out to them. So eventually, Junior and his sons packed up their prepper gear and personal belongings and moved to Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Coeur d'Alene is a beautiful city about 30 miles east of Spokane, Washington, and it sits on the beautiful lake of Harrison Slough. It has a laid back mountain city vibe, but Junior didn't move there to lay back. The areas beyond downtown are known to have white supremacists, neo-Nazis, and preppers. And this was the perfect place for Junior and his sons to survive the zombie apocalypse. It was also the perfect place to keep up his drug abuse. But the problem was that he had no money to support himself or his kids. So he took advantage of the community in Coeur d'Alene, a charity organization by the name of Society of St. Vincent de Paul, and ended up providing him and his two sons with an emergency housing unit at 1311 North 1st Street. Here, an Eldon Sr. would come and visit every once in a while to see how things were going. It's unclear if Eldon Sr. knew his son had a serious problem or if he was blind to it, but Junior's drug abuse had gotten so bad at this house that one night, he tried to get into his truck and drive while incredibly high. His son Eldon had to call emergency services on his own father, and he was hauled away in an ambulance in front of the entire neighborhood. So around this time, Eldon was 14 years old. He started having even more serious behavioral problems. At home, he would randomly assault his little brother, Jonathan, for almost no reason at all. He once stabbed Jonathan in the jaw with a pencil, and he also stabbed him in the back with a kitchen knife. Other times, he would take his father's firearms and shoot the neighbor's chickens in their backyard. And so it's clear that Eldon was just getting worse by the day, and obviously having to call the police on your own father. Things are not going great in this household. Some of his neighbors started noticing Eldon wandering around the neighborhood talking to himself. Other times he was seen walking in constant circles in his yard. His father at some point also boarded up the back door and windows of the house and he taped paper over the window panes. No one could see inside and very little natural light got into the house. But, you know, no one was reporting this suspicious behavior. It was only a matter of time before the dysfunctional Samuel household got much much worse. Eldon had also become violent at his new school and his grades were so poor to the point that the administration considered expelling him. He often complained to school faculty that he was too tired to stay awake in class and even when he was awake he suffered from intense migraines. After he had a health examination done by the school they discovered that several of his teeth were rotting inside his head. His father wasn't sending him to regular dentist appointments and his parents never taught him how to brush his teeth. He also had terrible hygiene and barely took care of himself. School staff eventually referred Eldon to a psychiatrist. He was diagnosed with depression and given a prescription for Prozac, but 
we know SSRIs and antidepressants like Prozac, they usually take a few weeks to kick in. I'm just wondering how, how the hell did CPS not just take him out of this home? Seriously. And like, did the school not right. contact CPS and say, hey, this kid, isn't that like a I think glaring they, problem where this kid, terrible hygiene, his teeth are rotting out, he can't stay awake at school? Like, is no one contacting CPS here? Yeah, it's just sad that the systems that are put in place to deal with these types of situations just sometimes don't work. Yeah, unfortunately. And they fail those that, that need it most. But then on March 24th, 2014, the day that Eldon was prescribed the medication, he came home from school and his father was in a fit of rage. His father, Junior, was out in the front yard holding a handgun and Eldon could hear his brother, Jonathan, inside the house crying. In a strange, rage-filled stupor, Junior fired off around into the air. Eldon then tried to convince his father to stop firing the weapon and come back inside the house. He told him the police were going to show up if he didn't stop firing the gun. Eldon was able to get him inside, but his father's rage and paranoia kept growing, and according to Eldon, his father then punched or pushed him in the chest. Junior then told his son that the zombie apocalypse had already begun. He needed the three of them to pack up their go bags and head into the foothills. Even though Eldon believed in his father's theory that the zombie apocalypse would arrive one day, he had seen that the neighborhood was quiet and there wasn't a zombie in sight. He could also tell something was off about his father, and by now he was fully aware of his father's drug abuse, so he told him he needed to go to bed to sleep it off. This only enraged his father even more, and according to Eldon, his father then shoved him again. In response, Eldon walked over to his father's loaded 45 caliber handgun that was lying on the couch, picked it up, and shot his father in the stomach. When he dropped to the floor, Junior tried crawling on his stomach toward Jonathan's bedroom. He was also trying to say something, but Eldon couldn't understand his father's words. He then watched Junior slowly drag himself across the floor and into Jonathan's room. Meanwhile, Jonathan was hiding underneath his bed. Junior then propped himself up against Jonathan's desk, and Eldon walked over to his father and fired three more rounds right into his father's head. After Junior was dead, Eldon found Jonathan hiding underneath his bed. He demanded that Jonathan come out, but he wouldn't budge. Eldon then fired several more shots at Jonathan under the bed. Then he went and grabbed his father's shotgun and fired at Jonathan multiple times, possibly up to 10 different times while reloading in between. After he stopped firing, Jonathan was still barely alive, but severely wounded, especially his legs. Eldon then lifted the mattress off of the bed frame while yelling at his brother. That's when Eldon grabbed a machete and began swinging at his brother as he tried to crawl out from under the bed. Eldon swung the machete as hard as he could, hitting his brother dozens of times in the hands, arms, legs, and head until Jonathan finally stopped moving. It's also believed that he stabbed his brother several times with a large knife. After he was through, Jonathan was dead, and Eldon then walked over to the phone and called emergency services. With no emotion whatsoever, he quietly told the dispatcher he would wait at the house for the police to show up. When officers arrived, Eldon was found standing on the porch with splatters of blood all over him. They immediately handcuffed him and placed him in the back of the squad car, where he quietly talked to himself. Meanwhile, police began investigating the home. Besides the disturbing amount of blood and gore, it was a complete mess. Dozens of pill bottles littered the floors and tables alongside empty liquor bottles. The place looked like it had never been cleaned. Police also found a zombie survival handbook and a series of knives, machetes, hatchets, firearms, brass knuckles, and throwing stars. There was also a fabric patch that had a skull with a radioactive symbol on it. The words zombie hunter, kill or get eaten were written along the edges. There was also a coffee mug with brass knuckles where the handle would be and it said, this is my zombie killing mug. When police interviewed the neighbors, they said they had seen Junior pacing around the yard earlier in the day. They also suspected he had been dealing drugs out of the home. And they found it odd that he had never spoken a word to the neighbors during the last eight months of living there. The only times they would see him, he would just sit out on his porch, chain smoke, and stare into the distance. So after a thorough investigation of the house, both bodies were later removed and taken to the coroner. The medical examiner's autopsy determined that Jonathan's cause of death was blood loss from the shotgun and machete wounds. As for Junior, his autopsy revealed that his liver was severely damaged from drug use. He had several different narcotics in his system, Oxycontin, three types of benzodiazepines, a muscle relaxer, and 
Ambien. The examiner noted that Junior should have been unconscious with the amount of Ambien in his system. They even wrote in their notes he had consumed a, quote, blackout level of Ambien. Which that goes to show why he was in such a bad mental state. Yeah. Standing out. I mean, who even knows what he was seeing walking around? Yeah, seriously. Hallucinating. Yeah, he could have been having crazy visions. Yeah. While police transported Eldon to the station, he could be heard whispering things to himself in the back of the squad car. Once he arrived at police headquarters, police began the initial questioning process. He was so disoriented that he couldn't remember his brother's age, his phone number, or the address of the house he had been living at for eight months. One of the officers in the interrogation room was already familiar with Eldon from school. So after establishing that connection, Eldon was more comfortable with talking. He was then read his rights and the questioning began. Which the whole rights thing in this this case is... Eh. First of all, the, the officer that they brought in, I think, was like a school resource officer or something yeah. uh, from the school. And they definitely brought him in. Because they knew him. Because yeah. they knew that he'd be able to build that rapport with him. Because they already knew what happened from the very beginning. So right. they're really trying to approach this with, we need him to confess. And when they're reading, you know, they give him the paper to sign with his, you know, Miranda rights on it. And he's very hesitant to sign it. He's like, how long is it going to take? And he's, you can tell that he doesn't like, he's smart enough to know that I probably shouldn't talk to the police, but you know, they're very persistent with him. They're like, no, it's okay. Like we need you, you know, we'd like to talk with you. Will you sign, you know, will you sign this? Is it okay? But they never mention like, oh, by the way, you're allowed to have a lawyer here present or yeah. a parent or guardian present here before we start questioning. They, they just don't even mention that to him as far as I know. Yeah, and it's, I think it's in the rights that they read off to him, but really, I mean, his state of mind too, at this right. point, we don't know exactly what it is. He also could be on several drugs, which we'll get into later. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're like, hey, that's the officer from school. I'm a 14 year old. I don't know anything. So I'm just going to do what they tell me these are authority figures and i always think back i know this is a completely different case but i always think of the brendan dassey you know it's this young kid and a lot he was intellectually disabled but you can just see in these interviews how they want to make sure that there is no guardian that there is no lawyer they want just to get you alone and they want to pressure you into saying yeah what they want right or and just this, straight up wear you down yeah yeah true just like you know talk and talk and talk and talk and mm-hmm. or ask you the same things a hundred different ways yeah until you just finally like i'm sick of this i'm tired i just want to get out of this room yeah so i'll just say whatever you want me to say yeah but, the larry ray right yeah. right so uh, and i also know like obviously he did do it right so i i understand that and they probably know that at this point too they had already examined the house and it was pretty clear from the forensics evidence well there's nobody else there yeah it's just him it's just him and he was the one who called and and he's he's got blood on him covered in blood right and so i get that yes he did something wrong and uh they're trying to get that confession but at the same time it's like this is a minor and they have no representation and they're possibly not in the right state of mind so i don't know it's like exploiting someone at their weakest point yeah is what it really comes down to it's like you know they could give him some time to just like think or relax you know calm himself down before sitting down top but that no it's like immediately we're going jump into it and it's very obvious from from the interrogation footage as you'll see in a minute that he's just like he's having a hard time even focusing i mean the trauma that he just put himself through right yeah and the things that he just saw and the feelings that he's having he just murdered his father and his brother brutally i mean that's gonna i mean it's gonna mess anybody up but a 14 year old kid i mean i'm just like it's just very obvious it affected him deeply yeah the holidays are already hard enough Stressful time of year, you got to get all those gifts out to all your loved ones and family members, and most of us have to ship those other places. And we have all been to the post office or the UPS store this time of year, and I swear every time I go, 
in the past, there's been a line out the door and it just takes way too long. But since I've been using stamps.com the past couple of years, I haven't had to actually go to the post office in a very, very long time because I can do everything that the post office can do right from the convenience of my home or office computer. And what's great is you don't need any special equipment, just a computer and a regular printer, and they'll even send you a free digital scale so you have everything you need to start printing postage today. And if you need a package pickup, you can easily schedule it through the stamps.com dashboard. And if you sell products online like we do, stamps.com seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping cart. Not only that, you can order shipping and mailing supplies and even printers from their supply store. But the best thing is I've saved thousands and thousands of dollars. I can't even tell you how much money I've saved because it'd probably blow my mind and yours. But you can get huge carrier discounts up to 84% off USPS and UPS rates to help out your bottom line or wallet this holiday season. Plus, Stamps.com automatically tells you your cheapest and fastest shipping options. For 25 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over a million small businesses, including ours. Get access to the USPS and UPS services you need right from your computer anytime, day or night, no lines, no traffic, and no waiting. Give your business the gift of Stamps.com so your mailing and shipping is covered this holiday season. Sign up with promo code LIGHTSOUT for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage, and a digital scale. There's no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com and click the microphone at the top of the page and enter code lights out. In Idaho, there's not really any limitations for police to speak with minors alone. The minor would have to make that request for an attorney or guardian to be present, and Eldon never does that. So they went on with questioning, and it wasn't long before Eldon confessed to killing his father. Let's take a look at some of that footage. So do you know why you're in the interview room with us today? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Why is that? Murdered him. Okay. So explain to me what happened. What do you mean by that? My dad? He was on his medication. Okay. Yeah. He needs some dude to do the thing. Well, you could have done it before. Got mad at me and beat me. Remember? I wanted to do something, but I couldn't. He just beat me. Next time, he did that. He was outside. He was shooting guns out there. Thinking there were zombies in there. And told me to go back inside. This was your dad? Yeah. And then you told him to go back inside? Okay. Yeah. Because he thinks there's a zombie apocalypse. He told me there wasn't. Okay. He told me to get out. To get out. He told me to get out. And so I said, no. My dad said, what? He just, he just started walking towards me. He hit me. He hit me. And I had the gun out. 40 pounds. Okay. And he hit me again. That shot. So it's pretty quick to admitting killing the father. He has no hesitation with that. And uh, he even goes on to elaborate a little bit more. And he straightened me to my room. And I had the gun out. And he hit me again. And I just pulled the trigger. And did he say anything? Kill Lana. Saying you killed me. So, okay. So you pulled the trigger? Yes. And you got the gun? Yeah. Okay. How many times did you pull the trigger? Once, that one time. Okay. I just shot three times. I had it. Three times? Yeah. Then what happened? Uh -huh. It's all right. You're doing good. I know it's a tough deal to talk about. It's all right. You're doing good. It's like you're giving us everything we need. Yeah, keep going. So we're, I think that's roughly 45 minutes into this interrogation and he still really hasn't talked about Jonathan at all. So he'll struggle with getting a confession about Jonathan for a bit here. Um, and for why that is, who really knows, you know, you could try and get inside his head, but. Yeah, and I think he's also, I mean, he's, He's a fairly smart kid considering all things. And I think he's the way he's kind of laying out killing his father is, is kind of create, you know, he's trying to 
very loosely create the illusion that this was self defense, right? Which again, we don't know for sure what happened if if there you know his father did hit him or something like that, and that's why he shot him. But based on what we what evidence we have, it seems like it was just he snapped and he killed his father. But he's yeah. trying to tell the police, like, no, my father was doing this to me, so I I killed him. But Jonathan's a whole different story. Right. And there is a little weird discrepancy in this interrogation where he at first says, my father punches me, and he's kind of describing him punching him in the chest, but then they later, the police officers get him to say that he was just being pushed, and I'm not sure exactly if that's because they don't want a self-defense mm, angle. That's a good point. And yeah. they even get him in like the written confession, they make sure that he writes, my Push. father pushed me, not punched me. So mm. there is, I don't know, that was a little tidbit I found curious. But he's going to us, John. Next, um, so we're with John or Jonathan. He was under the bed. Okay. Who's better? Yeah. Who's the bedroom? John's bedroom. So he has his own bedroom and he was under the bed? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How do you know he was under the bed? He went in there so John to get out. He wouldn't get out. Yeah, the room? Yeah. Why do you want him out of the room? Dad was there. He was just, he was like right there. I just wanted him out. Then when I have a, and it turned, I started taking apart the cushions the, of the mattress. She took him a lot, tried to grab him out. Like with your hands? Yeah. Okay. And what did you say to him? I'm going to get out of there. Okay. And what did he do? He just didn't want to go. And then what happened? That's all right. I can do it again. What happened after that? I can't really remember. So he's now, he's about your size. I mean, he's not too small. And I know that he doesn't like, um, he's got some issues with space, some spatial issues. I know that he doesn't take me a while for him to like me and talk to me, so I was good with him. So I'm sure if he was upset or if you're yelling at him, I can see how he might act, but I don't know how he acted tonight. So I need you to tell me. So you told him to get out. Yeah. Told him to get out. Same. Was your dad still a problem for him? Yeah. Okay. That was before I shot him three times in the head. So he started crawling, told him to get out. He was holding the shotgun. Who was? Dad. Okay. And he, he, he had it loaded and everything. And he just started pointing at John. Just tried it. Just shot him. So who shot? Your dad shot John? Yeah. He did? With the shotgun? Yeah. Okay. How many times? I'm gonna just turn like two times a turn. You start two times? Yeah, okay. Well time though. So he's claiming that his father had the shotgun and was the one shooting at Jonathan. He claimed that his father shot Jonathan because he was just disoriented on medication. That's that's his uh, explanation for what was going on. Then Eldon said he also he went outside the house for a time and he could hear Jonathan screaming and said that he just wanted to get away from it. So he's saying that he wasn't even inside when all this was happening. So he, for whatever reason, he's very quick to admit to killing his father, but he really struggles with admitting what happened with Jonathan. And then at some point during all this, I, his brain must just be scrambled eggs because then he's asking about where am I going to stay for the night? He mentioned wanting to contact his mom. He asked if he could go back to his house and get some things, which is really odd. And he specifically said he wanted to go back, get his Xbox 360 and a copy of GTA 5. He was like mm -hmm. adamant about getting that, which to me, I don't know about you, but to me that sounds like he doesn't, doesn't really understand what's going on. No, he's clearly not understanding the gravity of the situation. And I think in his mind, his explanation for everything checks out, right? And that this was self defense. My father was, my father killed my brother. He's going to kill me. So therefore, I had to kill my dad. 
and I think he thinks that the cops are, you know, believing everything that he's saying. Yeah. And so he's just kind of like, it's, you know, it's kind of that teenage brain coming back in being like, all right, well, I'm giving them what they want. So like, when am I getting out of here? Where am I going to sleep tonight? Video games. That's a good, yeah. Back to the games. That's some good insight. I I like that take on it that he's just like, he thinks he has the narrative figured out and he's ready to go. Yeah. He's he's clearly outsmarted the, the police in his mind. But the police are like, no, bro, yeah, <laughs> you're not we, going anywhere. Yeah, and we got the forensic evidence to show that. Yeah, the which they, which they say that up. quite a bit. Like, no, we've got detectives there at the scene. Mm-hmm. They're telling us what they're seeing isn't jiving with what you're telling us here in the interrogation room. And so I think I think as time goes on, you know, things kind of start clicking for him. But you know, they want to ask him specifically about about the zombies, and you know, they're probably like, this is very bizarre. We don't run into this kind of thing every day, right? And they they had found all that paraphernalia right, at the right, house, all the so weird they're like, zombies. "There's some obsession here going on." So yeah, they do ask him about the zombies. Why do you know he was all upset, paranoid about zombies? If he didn't say anything, he did his first medication. Okay. So, but he didn't say anything about zombies. You just attribute him taking that medication as to as to that's what he thinks. Huh? It, it was just. Uh, did he say anything about zombies tonight? Yeah. What did he say? He said that there might be zombies outside and stuff. So, did you believe him? No. Do you think, and I'm not trying to talk down to you, but do you think there's zombies outside? You don't think so. Probably not. Do you know what they are? Yeah. Do you believe in the zombie apocalypse? Do you believe that's going to happen? Probably. Probably. Yeah, what's going down with the Ukraine stuff? Probably. You talk to your dad about this type of stuff a lot? No. Probably just keep it all to myself. Okay. Well, it sounds like you and dad have that in common, though, that you guys believe in the zombie apocalypse and he's all like wanting to prepare. But Oh, like doomsday stuff? Like yeah. something bad's going to happen? Yeah. What do you do to prepare? He just prepared bought that trailer and all this other stuff, buying guns. Oh, the crappy brown trailer? Calls him out on the quality of the trailer. Uh, but yet, Eldon, during the zombie talk, he referenced Ukraine for a split second. And that, I was like, I have no, I have no idea what he's talking about. So I had to look it up. I think what he was talking about was there was this media crisis between Russia and Ukraine that escalated circa 2014 so about when this was going on without getting too deep into it basically many activists were mocking russians and ukrainians as being zombified or programmed by russian state media especially through their tv channels so protesters would sometimes dress up as zombies and march in places like saint petersburg and there were these big protests and so eldon's only 14 at the time, he's obsessed with zombies and his dad has convinced him this is bound to happen. So he might have not thought twice about what he was actually seeing on TV or on the news when they were showing these zombie protesters. So he might have just thought that they were real. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure his dad was probably spouting all kinds of crazy stuff about this too. Right. Like, see, son, there they are. Uh, Yeah. You know, it's happening. And not reading into anything (laughs) about what it actually was. Well, I mean, he's too... It's too fucked up on drugs to even be able to process it, probably. True. So, so after the zombie explanations, officers backtracked what happened to Jonathan. Eldon stuck to his story, saying that he was outside while his father killed his brother. When the officers asked why he shot his brother, he claimed he didn't, but they started to call out inconsistencies with his story. And even when Eldon started getting closer to telling the truth, he kept leaving details out. He admitted to swinging a machete and firing a shotgun at his brother, but his story didn't match the crime scene evidence. So the officers had to go over what happened multiple times. And after an hour of questioning, Eldon finally began to tell the full truth about what happened to Jonathan. I understand that it's traumatic and things like that. But at the same time, I don't believe a young man like yourself, seemed like a pretty smart kid, doesn't know what happened. So I need you to be 100% honest with me because I have detectives down at the scene that are telling me what they see and what they believe is happening or has happened. 
And so I need you to be 100% honest with me about that because some of the stuff you're saying is contradictory to what the evidence is telling us. Do you understand that? Yeah. Okay. Usually, the evidence doesn't lie. Okay? Usually. And I say that because sometimes it happens, but in this case, I, I don't think that it is. It's not too hard to understand what happened. Fair enough? But what we're missing is exactly all the details of what happened, and we're missing uh, basically why it happened, the real why, uh, and things like that. So, with that being said, did you shoot your brother? Well, you tell me. I wasn't there. It's a simple question. Which you get? I don't know. I wasn't there, Eldon. That's, dude, that's not the question. My idea is. Okay. So, what gun did you shoot him with? I think the shotgun. I know what shotgun was. And a few times? Yeah. Okay. A few to me is three. Okay. So, how many times did you shoot him? Well, I had a shotgun wound two at a time. Then, started like trying to get him under the bed. So, how many times do you think you hit him with a shotgun? And where? Legs. Five times. You hit him with the legs five times? He five shots to the legs. I don't know. I wasn't that. God. Weird that he also will, like, he like physically shows them how he's shooting and making sound effects and stuff. But I'm just like, I just can't get the thought in my head of like poor Jonathan being shot potentially five times with a shotgun at like point blank range, right. basically. And just like the damage that a shotgun does is just, uh, is just devastating. So, and the fact that he's, you know, he's on the spectrum and yeah, I can imagine how terrified he was. Yeah. Um, hiding under the bed, knowing like listening to everything that's going on. Then his own brother's like firing at him, lost his mind. Yeah. They're really trying to find out why the hell he would just start shooting his brother like that. Why'd you do it? My brother. He was the reason why my dad was taking the education. Because he just makes everybody mad. In the stores, I started really hating him. How long have you been hating him? Like years. Yeah, how many years? A lot of years. You're 14. Nine years. You've been hating him five. Five years. Okay. My mom couldn't handle the stress. She made it more so. She ran away. Have you ever thought about hurting your brother before? Yeah. Yeah? How would you have done that? Probably a long time ago. What? Around six. What? I just stabbed him. Didn't bother him. You stabbed your brother in the back? Yeah. And you get caught? I don't think so. It was like six years old. You stabbed your brother in the back with what? Hmm? What's what? A knife. Like a kitchen knife. Like a kitchen knife? Did he bleed? I don't know. I don't remember. I think he didn't bleed. How many times did you stab him? Just once. You get in trouble? You didn't get in trouble. You stabbed your brother in the back. Did your dad know about it? Think so. so where does this anger come from? Him. Your brother? Where does the anger come from your dad? You didn't. You didn't have anger towards your dad? Well, I find that hard to believe when you just shot your dad four times. So where does your anger come from your dad? He used to beat me. Okay, and I've heard you say that, but you haven't really explained that. What do you mean he used to beat you? Just beat me. I loved him. But next time that he came after me. You had decided that you were going to do something about it? Yeah. What did you decide you were going to do? Shoot him. That's what you told yourself. Next time he came at you, you were going to shoot him. Yeah. When did you first think that? Just right at that point. When was that, though? Last night. This night. This night? Yeah. So, I, I notice he is crying here. You know, and you, 
I, that could be for many reasons, but I know it was like right when he's now telling the truth about his traumatic experience and how he hates his brother and but he loves his dad. Yeah, he said he loves his dad, which is peculiar. I mean, we see that's sometimes the abuse, right? It's like you can still love your abuser. So I think that's probably playing into it here as well. It's hard to really take anything seriously what he's saying though. Just because I mean, you can just tell he's his mental headspace is just gone. It's True. Just, he, he's like not even there. He's having trouble just understanding the questions and. It, it does seem like the police are kind of like trying to lead him a certain way too. They're like, you know, they're trying to get exactly what they need out of him, but without really like worrying about how this is affecting him or, you know, I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's tough to watch like just yeah. all, all around. I don't know. Yeah, that's tough position. Cause it's like, yeah, you want the confession, but I don't know at what cost here. I mean, well, I they already know what happens. I mean, they have the forensics, so it's like they could they've already got him. Yeah. I mean, it's just like maybe give him a moment to like breathe and just, you know, calm down. I mean, given he's just like he just seems like agitated. Yeah, he's, and jittering. he's kind of he's, moving around. He's like curling his toes and stuff and yeah. You know, I think he's almost like getting frustrated with them for like continuing to probe him. Yeah. Eldon then proceeded to tell the officers how his father abused drugs once a month or so, and after he had called the police on him, he feared the abuse would escalate. He also admitted that he hated his brother because his autism required a lot of attention from his parents, and he thought that his dad wouldn't have been addicted to prescription drugs, and his mother wouldn't have left him if his brother was out of the picture. Man. But here's uh, some more interrogation footage uh, of the police asking him how long he had been thinking about killing his brother and father. So how long have you been thinking about hurting your brother? A while. How long is a while? Can you tell me what kind of thoughts you had when you when you think about hurting your brother? I just didn't want to want hear him. Okay. So what were your ideas on how to make that happen? This Get killed or something. Huh? Get him killed or something. Get him killed or something. So, in, in your thoughts, the way that this needed to end was your brother to die. My mother would have left. But that's for my dad. Because my dad treated her life. Okay? I was dead. My mom left. I'm sure you were. What makes you really mad? The most mad thing that Jonathan did, what, what was it? Like, if I, like, dad, my dad bought a candy bar for John, and, and I told him not to eat it, and I walked back, he would eat it. Oh, my God, to me, he's mad at me. Why would you tell him not to eat it? Because I don't want to eat it. Oh, right. And he would just buy one for Jonathan? Yeah. Why would he buy one for you? Oh, well, he did, but. So you want it both? Yeah. All right. Well, that's, that's honest. Do you think that's fair? For me? All right. For you, that's fair. That's a good statement. Well, why for you is that fair? It's okay for me. Yeah. Well, it's good. But not for him. And then if he said, if he, if he didn't do what you said, you'd be pissed at him? I'd be pissed. Yeah. How pissed? Yes. Real pissed? You ever fought with your brother before? No. You think throwing stuff at him? He throws stuff out. It's annoying stuff he brings back from school, like it's clap hand stuff, he break that stuff, throw it at it. It's him say, don't bring it yet. Why do you want your dad to die? Well, I don't want him to be killing me. Okay, so you're saying that you killed him so he wouldn't kill you? He's going to kill me all those times. I almost did him. What time was that? All the different times. Okay, and we've talked about that a little bit, but other than pushing and stuff like that, you haven't told me anything that would lead me to believe that your dad was going to kill you. So what am I missing? What time you we think about that, Bob? Uh, I was shocked. So when you were walking and he was crawling to the brother's room and you saw him and he was propped up, were you thinking, you know how we talked about it? I talked about, hey, we have these voices inside that say, well, I'm not going to let that happen again. I can do that. 
Did you go in there and said, I to save yourself, I'm going to kill him, or did you think that? What? What did you think when you were walking to your brother's bedroom, what they got in your hand? He's a bad person. Okay. What else? I know that's not it. I just knew if he was, if he was going to live, he's going to come after me. That's what you thought? Yeah. Heavy stuff. Yeah. And it just a lot of it just like doesn't make sense. Like it just like yeah. the questioning is not going through clearly and he's just like keeps rubbing his eyes. He's just come I don't know, I feel like he just like wants it to stop at this point, but yeah. he doesn't like know what to say. Seems kind of disoriented. And it's a lot of the police officers talking. This isn't yeah. really like we're not getting like just a full blown confession here. It's a lot of them yeah. Well, you were thinking this, you were feeling this. And coerced it's not, would be yeah. the word. Yeah, mm -hmm. It kind of seems like a coarse confession. Yeah. A bit. As you just heard in the footage, Eldon was fearful that if his father had somehow survived this, that he would kill him and then his mother and even his grandparents. And he ultimately admitted to the police that he had no remorse for killing his father and brother. But then he began crying and later admitted that he, quote, kind of felt bad for killing his father, but not his brother. He also admitted that he imagined killing his father every time he was physically abused. As for his brother, he claimed he never thought about killing him, but he had imagined a better life for himself if his brother was dead. After almost two hours of interrogation, Eldon finally brought up that he stabbed his brother about 15 times with a knife after using a shotgun and machete. This absolute overkill showed police how much rage Eldon had towards his brother. Here's what he had to say. What do you think should happen to to you? Me? Yeah, if you were uh and you were talking to me, what should happen? I'm gonna go back to California. What about the legal stuff? What should happen? Jail, warning, what? Come on. Hey, Mom. You're smart you're smart, Dad. Give us a give us a gift. Yes. Yeah, what would you do? What should happen to someone that just killed their brother or their father? Die. Do you think a person should die? Yeah. yeah. Why? Because I probably deserve it. Do you think you deserve that? Yeah. Do you think you deserve to die because you killed your brother? You're dead. Yeah. Okay. That's some heavy shit. Uh, the police aren't holding back on him. Just despite his age you know yeah, it's just like no. what do you think should happen to you yeah which like, is kind of an unnecessary question here why do we even very much that? that but it does clearly give you maybe a little bit of his mind space in that moment where well it's crazy he almost does a 180 because he's like oh, i want to go back to california mm -hmm. because maybe he interpreted the question as what do you want to happen, to happen versus like what's what, the reality of what's going to happen to yeah, you? yeah and then it's complete opposite of just going back to California, it's, yeah, he thinks he should die. So here's a little more controversy. They didn't run a drug test on Eldon before the interrogations, and it wasn't until three weeks later they finally ran a hair sample drug test on him, found that he had Benadryl, lorazepam, and Prozac in his system. So Benadryl, it's used to treat allergy symptoms. Sometimes it can also be used recreationally as a psychedelic. People get uh, hallucinations off of it if you take enough of it. Lorazepam is typically for anxiety, which Eldon was prescribed. You can also abuse this and use it recreationally. And Prozac is an SSRI antidepressant. You really can't use that recreationally. What was strange was that he also had Celexa, which is another SSRI in his system, which he wasn't prescribed. Mm -hmm. So what, after police started thinking about why this would be, they thought that his father might have been stealing his lorazepam to abuse it, and then he was replacing the pills oh, with God, Celexa. So fucked. Yep. So, still, it's unclear why police didn't drug test him immediately, since they discovered yeah, he would literally think it's there's like pill bottles everywhere. all over this house. Why wouldn't they drug test him? Uh, I don't know. My theory is that... Well, it might negate their whole confession right so they just they might throw it out exactly so they were like well let's not deal with that let's just get him in here as fast as possible and get him to confess as fast as possible and they clearly like put the pressure on him like yeah and like they have him cornered yeah there and they're like 
you know, just hounding him with question after question after question. But after the interrogation concluded, Eldon was initially charged with first degree murder of his father, but that was later dropped to second degree murder during a preliminary hearing because there wasn't enough evidence to prove premeditation. Eldon was also charged with first degree murder of his brother, Jonathan. The next big question for prosecutors was, should Eldon go to a juvenile or adult detention center if convicted? The prosecution wanted to try Eldon as an adult, and they argued that the violent nature of his crimes made him too dangerous for a juvenile facility. Which, uh, you know, that's a big point of contention for people. It's very controversial. Charging, you know, sending a kid, essentially, a 14 year old, to an adult penitentiary. Yeah. My argument for this is that if he's too dangerous for a juvenile facility, why is that? Why don't we have max security juvenile facilities? Yeah. Why wouldn't there be some or, or corner... separation or something? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Segregation. Yeah. that They do that in prison with adults. They'll right. just segregate adults from other adults. So I, it confuses me why we can't do that with juveniles. I don't get it. These days, it can feel like money is literally flying out of your account. You have no idea where it's going. And oftentimes, those charges are going to all those subscriptions that we have. With fitness apps, delivery services, streaming services, gaming, you name it. There's likely a subscription service you're paying for, and it's very, very hard to keep track of those. And it's very easy to forget about them and then just be paying for a subscription that you no longer use. Well, that all changed when I downloaded the Rocket Money app. And I've been using Rocket Money for the past couple of months, and I absolutely love it. If you're not familiar with Rocket Money, it's a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, plus it monitors your spending, and even helps you lower your bills. You get your account linked up with Rocket Money, and then it's able to organize all of your charges and show you all of those subscriptions. But best of all, you can cancel it with the tap of a button, which is great because it saves you so much time and money in the long run from not having to pay for the subscription anymore. But make it so easy. You don't have to reach out to customer service. They do all the work for you and those subscriptions just drop off. They'll even try to get you a refund for the last couple of months of wasted money and negotiate to lower your bills for you up to 20%. All you have to do is take a picture of your bill and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members on average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. I love Rocket Money. It's free to download, free to try out. I pay for the premium subscription because it allows me to just manage all my finances there. I can do credit monitoring. I can get alerts for all my accounts. It really helps me just stay on top of my personal finances. I pull up the app almost every single day just to check on everything. And I love the email alerts it sends me to keep me in the loop of what's going on. So stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash lights out. That's rocketmoney.com slash lights out. Download it today. Get Rocket Money today at rocketmoney.com slash lights out. The defense argued for a blended sentence. They said he could be sent to a juvenile facility until he was 21 years old and then reevaluated for probation or adult prison. But in the meantime, they placed Eldon into a adult facility while he awaited his trial. But he had to be kept isolated from the general population, obviously for his own safety. I mean, putting a 14 year old in gen pop is, uh, I mean, with adult criminals, yeah, that's yeah, that's, crazy. So that was the stipulation was he has to be kept out of sight and he cannot communicate with any of any of the other adult inmates. So they just figured we'll just throw him in solitary confinement for 70 days, which that's crazy. I mean, we know we're dealing with a horrendous crime here, but this is wild to put that into perspective. Most incarcerated inmates spend about 30 days max total during their entire incarceration. In and solitary confinement. In solitary confinement. Yes. And he spent 70 days straight. Straight to God. During this time, he lost a ton of weight. He said he even began hallucinating. Since he was in this tiny small cell all day, his vision began to deteriorate. Because I've, I've actually heard of this happening to uh, men who are in submarines for too long. Since you literally, your eyesight, you're only looking maximum like 20 feet on a submarine sometimes, yet your eyes will just slowly deteriorate. And when you get out of the submarine, you can't see very far. Wow. So this is what was happening to him. 
and the isolation affected his social skills and behavior, which were already terrible to begin with. Did they with. look at his talk screen to see that he was on these med- these SSRIs right. and, and other medications to just to try to like at least find somewhere? There's got to be a cell in a wing of the prison that is you would think a little less busy right like there's got to be other options but to just throw him in solitary confinement i mean damn a child yeah. in solitary confinement for 70 days is wild to me and again i like i understand the gravity of these yeah crimes. he deserves it's to be for, locked up but for like, sure a solitary confinement like is that it's, necessary it seems like torture i'll i'll say it it's just seems wrong what they're doing here corrections officers noticed that he was withdrawn and weird after he got out yeah yeah makes sense after leaving solitary they sent him to a juvenile facility and it's reported that he supposedly thrived here he was kept separated from everyone he had his own cell and separate meals he was able to go to school and take pe when his trial approached he was sent back to adult prison in solitary confinement it's unclear why he was kept here for so long it it, i mean it might have been due to behavior Mm -hmm. i don't know it seems strange that he would be thriving in juvenile and then he All would sudden, still yeah. have behavior problems. Maybe because he didn't want to be there. Yeah, right. And he knows what juvenile's detention facility is like. So he's like, why am I here? Yeah. I'm like back in the hole. It's seriously, yeah. And who wouldn't have behavioral problems after being in solitary for 70 days straight? It's crazy. Or it might have been just to legally protect the facility under the terms which Eldon had to be kept separate from everyone else in the adult prison. So... Could be a mix of both. His trial began in January 2016 and lasted about three weeks. Eldon could not plead insanity, which I didn't know this because Idaho had abolished the insanity plea. Oh, wow. 1982. Yeah. The defense tried to throw out the taped confession evidence by claiming that Eldon did not, quote, knowingly, intelligently, and voluntarily waive his Miranda rights and his statements to the police were not voluntary, end quote. I kind of believe, you know, kind of tend to side with that argument because if you watch the footage, it's just, yeah, they they really did not explain his rights to him. Yeah, and he just doesn't seem right during that whole thing. They claim that he was not mentally fit to sign a Miranda agreement at the time, but unfortunately this motion was later suppressed because Eldon had refused to meet with a state mental health expert to prove that he was not mentally fit at the time. So... That's just could have helped himself, but yeah, for whatever reason. Yeah. But during the trial, more than 200 people testified, including Eldon's mother, Tina. Her testimony showed the jury how horrific their household was before she left. Junior's abuse was escalating and their sons were exposed to violence and violent media as early as four or five years old. Two of Eldon's previous teachers were even brought in from Lakes Magnet Middle School and they mentioned how he struggled in school, his grades were poor, and he was often absent. But they also mentioned that he was typically quiet, polite, and he tried to learn when he was there. A local pediatrician and dentist also testified and explained how poor Eldon's health was, including his father's beatings, only eating one meal a day some days, migraines, nausea, blurred vision, congestion, and rotting teeth. The prosecution focused on the severity of the crimes and how violent Eldon's actions were. He had used multiple weapons against his family members with the full intention of brutally killing them. The defense argued that his father had given Eldon some of his prescription medication that had altered his state of mind at the time of the crimes, and they claimed Eldon killed his father in self-defense and killed his brother in rage that should have been considered as manslaughter, not murder. In the end, the jury found Eldon Gale Samuel III guilty on both counts, and he was ordered to be held in a juvenile detention facility. While there, he gained back his weight and his social skills improved. Staff at the juvenile facility claimed that Eldon was an upstanding inmate and his grades in school improved as well. His sentencing was in April 2016, and the court listened to seven hours of testimony before the judge decided whether to send Eldon to adult or juvenile prison. His mother, Tina, said that Eldon was all she had left, and she would give her life in the place of her son if she could. Eldon then made a statement to the courtroom saying, quote, I'm not the same person I was two years ago. I've changed physically, spiritually, and emotionally. I feel like a whole new person, but that doesn't excuse what I did that night. I lost my dad and my brother. Johnny, my own little brother. I only asked for mercy and righteousness. The prosecution admitted that Eldon was a product of his upbringing. Which, yeah, clearly. Yeah. But he needed to spend some time away from society as punishment for the crimes he committed. 
In the end, Judge Benjamin Simpson took everything into account, including the state psychiatrist's claim that Eldon suffered from reactive attachment disorder. Reactive attachment disorder, this is straight from the Mayo Clinic, is a rare but serious condition in which an infant or young child doesn't establish healthy attachments with parents or caregivers. Reactive attachment disorder may develop if the child's basic needs for comfort, affection, and nurturing aren't met and loving, caring, stable attachments with others are not established. With appropriate treatment, children who have reactive attachment disorder may develop more stable and healthy relationships with caregivers and others. Treatments for reactive attachment disorder include learning how to create a stable, nurturing environment and providing positive child and caregiver interactions. Parent or caregiver counseling and education can help. So, in other words, Eldon didn't receive affection like being held when he was a child. Yeah. And I wonder if this is why Eldon later thrived in juvenile prison, because he's like, this is the only stable environment I've ever experienced in my life. I 100% agree with that. Yeah. I think he, I mean, his life was in such turmoil, especially like those early years are so impressionable and like really shapes who your kid is. And as a, as a parent now of a young child, like, that has never been more real to me than, than now. Like it's so critical in those early years that your your child has a stable routine, gets the love and affection from their parents, because and bonding. Like there's so much bonding that happens early on. Like my daughter is already like attached to me. Like yeah, and she's you know she sees me and comes to me. It's just like it's the best thing about being a parent. And when I hear parents that just don't do that, it's it's shocking to me. It's like how can you not? You know, and I guess there, you know, drugs and other things yeah. play into why that doesn't happen. But yeah, I, I tend to agree with this diagnosis that the lack of stability and attachment to any sort of parent or guardian or caregiver has has led him to this point. I mean, I think it's pretty obvious. Yeah, I think back on what his half sister Natasha said about him. Never, never had, had a chance. chance. Yeah. yeah. Before sentencing Eldon, the judge said that this case had been a tragedy since Eldon was five years old. He also said, quote, What Jonathan went through in the last few minutes of his life had to be absolutely terrifying, especially considering his inability to regulate his emotions through no fault of his own. I don't put a lot of weight into punishment, Mr. Samuel. You're going to have to live with the fact you took Jonathan's life for the rest of your life. And whether you think it's fair or unfair, whatever you think about it, it's always going to be coming back at odd moments. You're going to have those dreams for a long time about what if Jonathan hadn't died. It's at least understandable, while not excusable, with respect to your father given his history of treatment of you. He then proceeded to sentence Eldon to life for his brother's murder, 20 years fixed with 5 years indeterminate, and 15 years, 10 years fixed with 5 years indeterminate for the murder of his father. Since both sentences were to be served concurrently, Eldon would have to at least serve 20 years before being considered for parole. The next issue was figuring out where to send Eldon, an adult or juvenile facility. The judge first sent him to solitary in an adult prison because he felt Eldon was too dangerous for a juvenile facility, but after back and forth arguing for a month, they finally decided to place him in a juvenile facility until he was 18 years old. Eldon quickly appealed, but in 2019, the Supreme Court upheld a sentence, and today Eldon is 23 years old, serving his time in the Idaho Correctional Institution in Orofino. He will be eligible for parole on March 24th, 2034. Just got a long ways to go still. Yep. What a, uh, this whole case is just, it's oh, really just, yeah. yeah it's just, it, and it's just this kid falling through the cracks in every single, it's like you think about Child Protective Services. Where were they during so much of this? Your school you think about the school but then even i mean not even like you know we can pin it on the uh the the public services for failing but also just at home really the core root of this his parents completely failed him eldon senior the grandfather yeah failed him could have been looking out for him just there was nobody looking out for and i'm sure his mother lives with tons of regret for not doing more yeah and I wonder if she knew that this was ultimately what was going to happen or something terrible was going to happen. Just, I mean, with how many weapons they had in, in that house, how many drugs were being taken in the house and just the, the violent media being consumed. I mean, 
it doesn't oh, really surprise I was gonna, me. I was going to ask you that. When was like the first time you watched a like hyper violent movie? Do you remember? Probably like 14, 15. Okay. Not yeah. at my house, but at a yeah, friend's yeah. house. <laughs> See, my parents were semi strict on what I could watch. And I think I watched The Matrix when I think I was like 12. And I think I watched Jaws when I was 12. But most R rated movies, I couldn't watch. I could only watch certain movies with them, mm -hmm. but I think I really couldn't watch R rated movies till I was like 13, 14. Uh, what about you, Daniel? I mean, I grew up in a house where I wasn't allowed to watch SpongeBob until I was like 10, but I, <laughs> I did end up watching the original Predator at a friend's house, maybe like nine or 10 years old. Okay. Yeah. And the, he was subjected to this stuff when he was four or five, they estimated. That's so early. I That's know. so bad. I couldn't even imagine showing. I mean, even now, like we're starting to like watch movies and stuff, and we're like, "Is this is this gonna be okay?" Yeah, it's yeah. like rated PG, but they we're say, like, "Is it this good for they her?" They say yeah. the word "crap," and you're like, "Yeah, no, yeah. yeah." But yeah, so I can only imagine kind of also how desensitized he was to violence by the time he was in his teenage years. I mean, I, I'm not defending him. I'm just saying these are this was his reality that he was living in. So. It's not really a surprise to me when something ultra violent happens when just your whole life is consumed by violence. And he doesn't even really seem to be that shocked by what he did. No. You know what I mean? Like he's he's shocked that he's in the position he's in, but like I don't know. I mean, unless it's just I mean, he could just be dealing with it all internally, but True. which he probably is, but like externally he doesn't seem like overly traumatized by what he just did. Yeah. You know? And like he's showing how he's like shooting his brother and the sound effects that act yeah. wild to me that someone who would just go through something like that is recreating it in that type of way. Well, and to be fair, at one point they did ask him to demonstrate using the machete. That's right. They um, made him get up. Yeah, they made him get him. up and like he started going like, no, that's not how hard you were doing it. And he like does it again harder. harder. I'm like, God, these cops were just, I mean, the cops were totally exploiting him and, yeah. and we're like, we're going to get all the evidence we need. So this is like clear cut. This is how he did it. This yeah. is, you know, and I do think there was a violation of, of, of his rights there. And it's a shame that there's not, you know, more like at the very least, I feel like children should have some, you know, a lawyer present immediately. Like that should just be a given because like any adult in, in a lot of the cases we've covered lately, Grand Amato and stuff like they'll talk to police, but then, at a certain point they're like they shut up and they know their rights and they're like i'm gonna be quiet now yeah until i get my attorneys involved but like a kid just doesn't understand like there's no way a kid 13 14 years old is gonna understand the like gravity of the situation they're in and how important it is to have legal representation especially in this kind of case where you're facing life in prison or the death penalty like and yeah i didn't i mean when i was thinking of myself at 14 i didn't know what like i didn't know my rights no. and i didn't know i had never seen an episode of law and order until i was like 15 so even then the the process wasn't even familiar to me at all so how would i even know well even like interacting with police too i mean unless you're in trouble a lot as a teenager um maybe you had a few run-ins with police but like at 14 years old i definitely didn't have any run-ins with police at that early on um, so it's like you don't know like because they they really come across as like being on your side and like kind of like being there to help help you through it in a way and they're like we want to help you and they say things like that and i feel like for a kid you're just gonna you know probably take them for what they're saying but ultimately they're gonna use it against you 100 percent for sure time. and and they did in this case like that's what happened and i think the reason we're talking about this because yes he did do it and it is horrific crime that's i i can't imagine the level of violence that was found in that house but the problem is that there are repercussions to things like this so we take this kid in this interrogation room and we go through all of this and we see how violent he is and getting him to say all these things i don't know maybe that set the groundwork for why he ended up in solitary for 70 days straight right like I think there's maybe a correlation between getting him to say all these things and then throwing him in solitary and throwing away yeah, the key for a yeah. while, right? So even though he did do it, I mean, he's still a child at the end of the day. It's 
it's still we've brought this up before that why do we why is there even an option to, to try kids as adults doesn't really make any sense if we have the juvenile process why isn't that just revised to include something like this rather than saying this is too horrific we just need to bump him to adult yeah yeah it's well if it's an antiquated system for one yeah and oftentimes a judge does use the the violence you know the violent aspect of the crime you know makes him a danger to all other juveniles but it's like like there's enough violent juveniles that maybe you need a violent juvenile center you know what i mean right. somewhere to send those that are extremely violent so yeah it, it is very weird because i think i mean you ask any psychologist or psychiatrist and be like the brain is you know i mean your brain isn't done developing till like your late 20s i think yeah. it is so i still feel like my brain's developing so but stupid yeah sometimes. well like 14 to I, even like 18 is such a major jump yeah I mean, I, I was so stupid back then. I knew so little, and especially I didn't even come from an abusive household. So adding all these layers on top of it, yeah, he just never had a chance. No, and I mean, I, I think the, the punishment fits the crime in this particular case. I think 20 years for, for what he did is adequate time to, to spend. And then nine bars. But. Do you think he'll get out on parole when the time comes? I have a feeling he will. I mean, you know, a lot of factors go into to paroling, and I think one of the th obviously how you are in prison, and it seems like he's kind of a model prisoner, and he's really tried to like, you know, the one positive like rehabilitate himself and like get kind of further his life in a positive way, uh, which is always good to see, and then. You know, the victim's family usually comes into uh, purloing someone, and his family is supportive of him, uh, probably, of, of getting out. And I mean, he'll be, what, how old when he gets out in 2034? He would be 30. In his 30s. 31? Yes. Yeah, so or 34, I think. So he's still, I mean, that's still a lot of life to live. And oh. I just hope for his sake that he's you Even know, able to. Even if he didn't get paroled, we do know that in that juvenile facility that he was thriving. So maybe that structured life for him, you know, even if he doesn't get paroled. If he does get paroled, I hope that he can find that same structure on the outside, right? Yeah. I think, I think some people would argue too, like, is he too dangerous to parole, right? Is he still a danger to society? despite everything and i think that's a really tough question to answer without you know being inside his mind or being a psychiatrist who's observed him before um i mean the natures of the crimes were extremely brutal and cold and you know would he is he does he have the potential to do that to somebody else right. I think that's a tough question to answer but it seems to me the environment played heavily into these events taking place agreed and unfortunately, the answer to that question is going to be in the hands of the system, right? Yeah. So which, they're going to have to determine that, which, can we trust that? Yeah, I don't have a lot of faith in the system, but I guess we'll see what happens with this. Yeah. What do you think, Danny? You feel like he, 20 years is adequate for what he did? And how do you feel about him paroling? I mean, him paroling, I feel like, Part of me feels like he does deserve a shot at life because he he, like, he never really did have a chance. He, he really never did, but also with the violence and anger that he had towards his brother and the way he ended his brother's life really pulls me in the other direction. As far as the dad goes. It's pretty self-explanatory yeah, there, like yeah. what happened, yeah. I, I think, I'm not saying the dad deserved it, but like it, it, I, it makes sense why that happened. But with the brother, that doesn't make sense to me. And I think that was a lot of misguided anger. I think he blamed, he took a lot of the issues that he had with his family and blamed them on his brother because maybe his dad would say things. Sure. Or something yeah. like that. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I think he deserves to at least a second chance. Okay. Some degree. Yeah. I think 20 years, that's already taking his youth. But I mean, what is he going to have when he gets out of prison after those 20 years anyway? Yeah. Well, that's, that's the one thing I do worry about with Eldon is if he does get out, 
is he going to end up right back in the same spot again? Yeah, where's he going to go? You know, where's he going to go? He has his mother and maybe his grandfather. Like, he doesn't have a lot of family support. Is the drugs going to be an issue again? I mean, hopefully he's, I mean, there's drugs in prison, as we all know. So is he, is he going to be able to, like, get clean and sober when he comes out and completely turn his life around? Or is there potential for him to fall back into that dark place? fall back into the obsession with zombies again when he has access you know once he gets access to video games again he's going to start playing gta and all the zombie games again and that that obsession going to be reignited and that paranoia going to set in and you know could he find himself in a position again where he he completely loses his mind and and you know essentially becomes his father i think it's a possibility because and just the i think the nature of him killing his brother really worries me because that's you know it's deep deep rooted issues that he has and i worry about him is he going to be able to overcome that or is that evil within you know is that is that going to leave him or is that going to come out and show its ugly head at a later time i mean being programmed that young for that long right does he even have a chance yeah it's going to be a that would be an incredibly hard mold to break i'm of the opinion that i think it just comes down to what if you think people can fundamentally change from when you're 14 to if you're 34, let's say, which I think he can. Seems like a very hard, long road, but I I would have faith that he can change. I don't necessarily have faith in the system to evaluate him on that change. Uh, I don't know. It's such a horrific crime at the same time, and potentially if there is something along the way where his evaluation isn't accurate, and he does get out, and he still has these anger issues. Uh, and it's like he doesn't know how to be a productive member of society. Yeah, he's, he's gonna like. What is he starting from? Yeah. So I hope there are. This, I hope the system gives allows him to be able to make that change. And I don't know. That's that's. It's just a completely, for a lack of better words, here it is a completely fucked situation. And I don't have faith in the system to rehabilitate him, but I do have faith that as a person, Holden can, can turn it around. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm definitely not hopeful. And I do, I do think there's a possibility he won't, won't actually get paroled. Yeah. And they'll same. just keep him for life or, you know, longer than the 20 years. But, but yeah, this is a really tough one. I mean, that you can look at this from all the different angles and kind of, a bunch of different ways about it so we want to know your thoughts on this case uh do you think eldon uh deserves the the punishment he received should have been more should have been less do you think he'll parole let us know your thoughts below if you're watching on youtube or you know watching us on spotify hit us up on social media tiktok instagram all the places at lights outcast but that is going to be it for us today we'll see you guys next week with another spooky one and until then lights out everybody <laughs>